Hey folks, Sega Sonic fan here, and I'm working on an AudioVox 10-inch portable DVD player. The 10-inch players are some of the largest screens you can find, and for that reason they're quite nice. I do like portable DVD players quite a lot for watching movies in bed. Call me old school. And uh, this one I got at a fairly good price, but it arrived broken. The backlight did not turn on when I uh, got it in the mail. And boy, was the seller pissed off at me. He thought I was trying to scam him, but um, he didn't pack it right. And the this is the end of the part of the display, and it cracked. And there's a, there's a glass tube in here, in these older players. They don't use LEDs. They actually use CCFL, which is a cold cathode fluorescent lamp. And these actually have some mercury in them, so, you know, don't lick them up or whatever. Uh, but yeah, this one broke, and uh, the backlight wasn't gonna, was no dice, so I was uh, feeling pretty bummed about that. Fortunately, if you look online, you can find LED replacements that come with this little mini board that you see here. Pretty cool stuff, and you can get ones, you know, all different measurements. You could probably cut them, too, since it's just a bunch of series LEDs. I think uh, you could probably cut it to size if you get a larger one. But I got this one, it was only about four bucks. And I love, I love inventions like that, where you make the old new again through a, a inexpensive part like this with newer technology. It's very cool. So uh, the only downside was when I got this, there were no instructions on the listing or in the package that I got. So I had to figure it out on my own. And uh, I did. Fortunately, at least for the most part, you'll see in the bottom there, it's upside down, but it says VCC ENA, which is enable, ADJ, which is adjust, and GND, which is ground. Well, I didn't know what voltage enabled it, if it's active high or active low. I don't know anything about the adjustment for the brightness yet. I'll go into that. I'll look into that later. I'm not as concerned with that. And I didn't know how much voltage uh, I could, I could, how many volts I could give it before it got toasted. These are all questions you really need to know before you start plugging stuff in. So what I ended up doing was looking up the part number for the chip and I forgot it. But what I can do is I was going to see if I can pull it up on my phone. What I'll do is what I did before, which is I'll turn on my digital microscope here, which by the way, collects dust like nobody's business. And we put this under the microscope. And we see it says, what does it say? Let's get the lighting on there, right? DF6113. DF6113. So I looked that up and, you know, it's a backlight controller. What a shocker. And it takes uh, anywhere from five to, uh, I think, 24 volts. So that's nice and handy. So first thing we've got to do is find our voltage on our built-in board here. This is actually the board that comes with the screen. And we, we want to find like a 12 volt source or something, something around that, maybe nine volts, whatever runs to the main power rail. Actually nine volts is better because this runs off a nine volt power supply. So I want to look for a large bulky capacitor with large traces leading to the, uh, the main plug here. This is the ribbon cable for the LCD, so we're not concerned with that. We're concerned with this plug. And if we look over here, we got this big fat trace, and then we have what is presumably a ground copper plane going to a large capacitor rated at 16 volts, 16V. So that's a good sign. That's going to be the, uh, the main bulk capacitor, the bypass capacitor for the main power rail. And sure enough, it is. I measured it. It's like 9 volts, which is great. And after that, though, it didn't turn on. And so I was like, okay, well, this enable thing is important. And they don't actually have a, a pull-up resistor or a pull-down resistor. Turns out it would need a pull-up resistor to turn on. And so uh, what you want to do is you want to be careful when you have an enable line like this that you don't know if it's active high or active low. You always want to put a 10 kilo ohm resistor in between a power source uh, so you don't blow anything up. Because that's basically going to function like the gate of a MOSFET, where uh, if you give it the wrong polarity, it could could blow things up. So how did I, f and so, so the next thing was I wanted to have an enable, right? Well, it turns out it is active high and I could have just tied this wire directly with the resistor to uh, this power pin here and it would just always be on as soon as I turned on the player. However, these players 
have a little switch over here in the back where when you close the lid, it turns off the backlight. Kind of handy, especially because I like to close the lid when I'm getting sleepy. So I wanted to find out what, uh, what logic signal was controlled with that pin. Well, through my educated guessing and deductive reasoning, uh, I'm, I know this is, uh, this is the large high voltage coil for the, uh, the backlight, the CCFL, which, which wires in right here. These are the high voltage, it's the high voltage output. So I know this is most likely going to be like a PWM controller to do a pulse width modulation to create the large high voltage there. And I know it's going to be driven by, you know, most likely this power rail, you know, the main power rail. And I know that the main power rail coming in is going to be large traces, like you see these two large thick traces here. And I know there's got to be at least one really tiny trace, which is going to be the on and off signal, because I'm pretty sure this is going to have an on and off controlled by that switch. You know, it's unlikely that they'd have an external MOSFET for that. And so lo and behold, I found this little tiny trace here. I put my multimeter on and I, you know, hit that switch, this guy right here with my finger. And sure enough, when the lid's closed, it's zero volts. And when the, when the lid is open, when that switch is open, when it's not being pressed down, it's three volts. And that's because this most likely uses three volt logic for the, uh, for the rest of the player, as well as for this microcontroller. Um, well, this is a, this is a, yeah. Anyway, uh, so yeah, that was my active high signal controlled by the switch. So I just put my resistor there and bada bing, bada boom, it turns on. The only thing left is the dimming, which I'm not too worried about. Um, I'll figure that out later if I really want. My guess is it's going to be just a potentiometer wired up to the, the adjust signal. And that could be a pain to like wire that down into the player. I have to go through the harness here and psh, might not even be worth it. We'll see how bad it looks or good it looks as is. Um, I don't think there's going to be a way to, well, there might be a pulse modulation signal uh, that the, that the, that's already controlled by the microcontroller. If I could tap into that, that would be nice. That's an idea, but uh, for another time, I'm just happy I got this working. So I'm gonna go ahead and just show it to you. If I turn it on, and get a little startup flicker there, and you'll see if I move this, it's nice and bright. That's the backlight. And if I put it over the, the switch, like when the lid's closed, it turns off. There you go. So now I got to take off this metal shielding here. Um, there's these little clips here. It's a bit of a pain, but I should be able to put this in and then hopefully have a pretty decent screen. Hopefully the, uh, you know, the LED will work just as well as the CCFL with the reflection, the reflective pieces that are in there. And uh, we'll, we'll revive this DVD player, which is worth about 30 or 40 bucks. Some people will say not worth your time, but I like to revive old electronics. So have fun, and uh, if you want to make uh, some repairs with these boards, they're pretty cool. This is Sega Sonic Fan, signing out.